Great. So um, I'm going to introduce, we've got uh, Christian, and I'm sorry, I, Rick. Rick. Rick, so fantastic, and uh, from the Adolescent Connections team, so ACT, okay. and uh, heading us off. That's Thank fantastic. You. Okay, so yeah, we thought 10 minutes was rapid fire session, but I guess we know we are going to see what rapid fire is. We're uh, very pleased to be here. Rick's starting my stopwatch because he's uh, told me I've got one minute and 45 seconds of this five minutes. But um, uh, we're uh, one of the small teams. Uh, we've, been, we've been talking to a number of the larger networks. We're very encouraged uh, by um, the, uh, the whole tram initiative. Uh, had a chance to speak to... Uh, uh, some of the leaders of the program and, and uh, let them know that what they've started, at least in our province, in New Brunswick, uh, is, is transformational already. Um, and so that's what we think we're bringing uh, to the process, um, a, uh, a team vision for a province that is tram ready. Um, and uh, if, uh, I don't know if that, uh, there we go. We're not quite there. There. Um, so this is our, uh, our model in terms of how we'd like to see the transformation uh, happen and the transformation that we feel is underway in New Brunswick already. Uh, very much uh, a youth and family focus and we're encouraged uh, by uh, the extent to which uh, uh, other teams and networks are, are bringing forward that vision. Uh, but around uh, family and youth and community, uh, service providers, community organizations, research and policy makers in a human rights and determinants of health perspective. Um, part of the difficulty uh, that I have in speaking to this audience is uh, you'll notice here that uh, in, with all this expertise in terms of Canadian mental health expertise uh, from across the land, uh, you've got two people here from New Brunswick, a lawyer and a police officer. Uh, so we are a little bit like one of these things is not like the other. Um, but in my day-to-day, -day, in the office of the Child and Youth Advocate, um, we get, you know, lots of stories of distress uh, and, uh, and, 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 and families that are really at a breaking point. And, and they're looking to the advocate to try to connect the dots in care. And so the way we understand the transformation that has to happen, uh, it's not really about breaking down the silos in... Uh, in Canadian mental health care uh, or in the health system generally. It is much broader than that. It, it's really a, a broader social transformation that you know, has to reach out to all the service organizations that are involved and might be a reference point for youth who need to access care, whether that's policing, whether it's their social worker, uh, their corrections probation officer, whether it's uh, their school teacher, uh, or, or, or any uh, number of community interveners. So um, we're, we're talking about doing that with an integrated service delivery model. Uh, there's loads of information with respect to that project in uh, the packages that we've distributed on your tables. Uh, we've put our expression of interest online on the TRAM Facebook page. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Rick, who's going to talk about one of the interventions, our youth intervention and diversion model, and the transformation that it's bringing about in New Brunswick, and why um, it, it, it might be a good idea to take some of your best practices and to put them to the test uh, in a living lab in our province. That's what we'd invite you to consider. So folks, uh, um, as Christian mentioned, I'm with the RCMP. My title is uh, Officer in Charge of Youth Intervention Diversion for the Atlantic Region. And I represent uh, a profession that stands at the, the door of what is often the default system to deal with people with complex mental health issues. And I can tell you that uh, when a few years ago I was in charge of national youth services for the RCMP and my responsibility was to create a strategy and, uh, for, for how we intervene with youth. And I can tell you that what I, what I saw when I took over that job was that I, had, I was in charge of stickers and coloring books and school talks and safety bear. And that just wasn't good enough. So what we did is we, we looked to experts across the country like yourselves, researchers, who, who uh, helped us to develop a model that would make uh, some significant change in policing. We developed a, a model based on the risk-need responsivity theory. Uh, we use evidence-based screening tools, assessment tools, mental health screening tools to screen youth uh, out of the criminal justice system. Um, 
you know, that national strategy, uh, it took, if, after about two years of frustration at trying to roll that out from Ottawa, uh, I realized that uh, I was going to have to go out to a province and do it myself, to get someone to, to do it on a broad scale. So I, I selected New Brunswick because of the transformational change that I saw happening there as a result of the Ashley Smith case and some of the reports that came out of that. And uh, we've created that national, uh, or that, that transformational change in New Brunswick. And as a result, I'm now in charge of intervention diversion for the Atlantic region. And I can tell you that my colleagues from across the country, from British Columbia, from uh, the, the north, are coming to me and, and, and it's now taking hold. In fact, uh, I, have, I now have more uh, influence nationally than I ever did when I was in charge of the program nationally because I've implemented this at the front line. And come and see me and I'll tell you about the results that we've seen. They've, they've really, they really are transformative. I've seen huge uh, reductions in youth crime in New Brunswick. Uh, you know, um, we're about to mobilize crime prevention resources. I'll just show you this continuum really quick. So right at this far end, at my end of the continuum, you'll see that's where stickers and coloring books and school talks are. And what we've done is we've taken resources that we've been spending money on for a lot of years at this end of the continuum, and we've moved them up to deal with that yellow uh, region. So we're, I, I, we use the term moderate risk youth, but it really gets into high risk youth as well. And we're, we're basically, we've taken those resources, we've turned them into crime prevention professionals, experts in crime prevention. They sit beside a police officer and they influence that police officer's discretion to get these people out of the criminal justice system. And we've chosen now to influence further into the community, not into the, the system, into the community. We're building capacity at the community level, again, are built around the risk-need responsivity model. So come and talk to us and we'll tell you more about how we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna mobilize those resources right across the country. There's millions of dollars being spent on things that are not working, and we can mobilize those resources to make a huge difference. Thank you. Great, Christian. Rick, thank you very much. Great example. Thank you. Okay. We now have uh, Peter Silverstone coming up uh, from Empathy, empowering a multi-sectoral pathway towards healthy youth. Over to you, Peter. Thank you. Okay, so uh, very brief presentation, and there's going to be two parts. The first one minute, two minutes to my peers, and the last two or three minutes to the panel with some somewhat provocative suggestions. Uh, one of the things to note about the talk is that many people have, uh, I love my notes here, many people have said many things, I'm repeating much of them. Uh, this is the network in Alberta, and if you really want to hear about transformation, ask anybody from Alberta about what's happened to the healthcare system the last four years. That has been really transformational, and we can perhaps talk about that another time. This is how we are linked in. We're part of the healthcare system, but we're linked to multiple agencies. There's only a few I'd like to point out if I had a pointer. It says school boards, teachers. Our primary call is with school boards. We work very, very closely with the school boards because that's the only way to get anything done. Uh, we have very unique interactions with patients and families. I was very interested about, about youth. We have two initiatives with youth. We have the youth who are well, and also we have lived experience youth, and how can we leverage uh, that experience. I'm going to talk about research experts. Actually, the best research experts that we're going to be dealing with is the Institute of Health Economics, uh, nationally founded. And that's because, really, when we look at what we're doing, we have to be very outcome-focused. I believe we have to be outcome focused and that's actually why I asked the question of the other networks. These are the outcomes that we have set up and you just heard a, a very erudite explanation of one of them uh, which is decreased range of interactions. But we have to do all of these four things, we have to meet all these four things. And last but by no means least, we have to demonstrate that we reduce costs. We have to do it and that's why I talked about the Institute of Health Economics. Uh, I'm going to quote a colleague who isn't here, uh, but Marnie and I well. Otherwise, the risk of all this is that it'll become yet another pilot. Unless we can convince provincial governments to scale up, and national governments, this will be a pilot. And, and, and as she says, unfortunately, Alberta has more pilots than WestJet because we, we do these things and, and they work and then they stay off. So how do we do that? That's a key issue. Well, cost is an absolute driver. And if you're able to show a clear uh, ROI, clear return on investment, you're going to invest uh, X million in this, but get back so many million within one, two, three years, then it becomes really likely. So that's the first part of my talk. Uh, just very, very briefly, uh, we have a series of modules. Uh, we have a 
uh, resiliency module, we have a screening module, and we have a school-based interaction module. The third one is absolutely critical, mostly because it's internet-based. The big concern with screening is that you do a lot of case finding. What do you do with all those cases? So they have to be managed at the school level in, in a manageable way. So that's done. We're also very closely linked to the primary care and specialist treatment, and as a health service, we're involved with all those. What's provocative? And my, what's provocative is what I think the panel needs to really do. The first is focus, and I, and I mean this in the best possible way. Age, we have age of 11 to 25, and yet TRAM talks about adolescence. And so are we talking about adolescence? Or are we talking about youth? Because that's the first issue. Are we talking about First Nations? Are we talking about specific disorders? What's the geographic distribution we hope to make a difference in? Are we actually focusing on prevention or on treatment? Are we looking at the biological underpinnings? And of course, the panel will say everything. But the reality is, given the time and the amount of money, we can't do everything. So what is the focus? And that brings me to my second point that obviously we need to consider, which is follow-up. This is a five-year program, and you heard previously about a 14-year network. What does that mean? What is the follow-up plan? What do we have in terms of potential future resources? How do we take things further? Because there is no way that we'll be able to achieve all of those things I talked about and all those things we've talked about within five years on the current budget. So what is the follow-up? And what is the scale-up? And again, how do we convince people? And so that lastly brings me to my provocative statement, and I have 50 seconds to talk about that, and that's this. My view of the next two days is not that we stick to the agenda. My view of the next two days is that we take everybody in this room and we say, what is the best network we can come up with on a multi-year level, looking at the multiple areas of focus that is affordable, but we then cost and say, OK, year one will be this. Maybe we're going to start in elementary school, junior high school. Uh, so we're starting kids aged 10 to 14. Maybe that's the initial focus. Then after one or two years, we're going to move to high school. Then we're going to move to other areas. Maybe we're going to focus initially on depression. Maybe we should focus on anxiety. Maybe we should focus on, on serious mental disorders. But let's figure out the people in this room. People talked about the expertise in this room. The expertise in this room is the best chance we have of getting together and saying, this is what we should be doing. We should be working as a group, because if we don't, we're going to go away and compete. And I, I say to my peers, we'd, we'd happily join any of you. All the networks presented were good. Huge numbers of similarities. Everybody wants the same aim. Why don't we sit down together and make it happen? And now's as good an opportunity as any. As any. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Now we have Caroline Tate on Indigenous Adolescent Mental Health. So, Caroline, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, and uh, I'm just very happy to be here. I love Montreal. Um, and I just want to acknowledge the um, First Peoples of this land, which are the Mohawk. Uh, who uh, so graciously have us on their land. What I want to present, um, oh, there we are. Uh, I'm going to present our slides, let me just see here, uh, and tell you a bit about us. Um, we're Saskatchewan First Nations Metis based team, and we're actually putting in an NCE application uh, on Indigenous health. Uh, the LOI goes in in. in um, August and and we have quite an accomplished research team in terms of indigenous health with many projects in adolescent uh, and youth mental health. What I would like to say, which I think is important, is that government policy is the biggest health determinant still in this country for indigenous people. And this presents this population as being particularly vulnerable in many ways. And we haven't talked about geography, geography, of course, being one of them, but jurisdictional as well. Um, and so we also have intergenerational um, issues where we have many families who, over the generations, have had um, government policies such as residential schools, child welfare policies, and that, that have enormous impact in terms of mental health outcomes. Uh, when I look at TRAM, and, and my advice would be, and, and I'm going divert, to divert from the slides a bit because you have lots of information about us, is that one of the things I think that TRAM could do at this point in time 
that everything that I've heard is really about ethical and moral obligation that we have to young people. So what I would suggest doing as the basis of TRAM is to really come up with an ethical foundation and I would go to the human rights, UN Declaration on Human Rights. I would also look at the UN Declaration of the Rights of the Child and go to these fundamental documents that provide us a direction to argue with decision makers in terms of the people who hold the purse strings to mobilize the change that we want. That I think that that's one of the areas, and certainly as Indigenous peoples, um, I happen to be Métis, although I don't look like it, but that's where we go is often the, to these international foundational documents. And I would say that that, that pulls us together. Um, in terms of ethics, we have looked, um, because of policy, government policy, that we look at ethics a lot. And what does ethical policy look like? So for instance, the application of best practices is a moral stance that scientists take that we take and say this is the best way to do it. That's an ethical stance. However, what we have in Indigenous communities are the watering down of best practice models. Um, pilots, uh, we pilot things that we already know work. Why is that? Why do we not allow for modification of those? Um, we also look at transition and the transitioning of young people. So the idea that the operation was a success but the patient died, um, really what that, that tells us is that we can have people, youth in, for instance, treatment, addiction care, but it's, and they, everything goes really, really well until they transition. And so why is that continuum of care not working? And just to, just to kind of sum up things, I think that what we need to do is to really, really look at also the ethics of inaction. That there's many things that are going on that we've known for years are not good. And yet, we, d we want to argue it from a systems point of view, but I think we need to argue it more and more from a moral point of view. Um, and collectively, I think there's a strong voice in this room to do that, including with Indigenous peoples. Um, and the last thing I'll just say is around research, and I'll leave that slide up for you to look at. And, and please, um, with the Tri-Council guidelines, if you, if you want to work with Indigenous peoples, you will have to understand the Tri-Council guidelines because this is a very long process for us as Indigenous people to engage our people in research. And so be aware of those because they will shape the ways in which um, the, the projects will evolve with our people. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Carolyn. We now have uh, Innovative Specialised Network in Mental Health and Youth Protection, helping youth with borderline personality disorder. And we have Lise Laporte. Good afternoon. I represent a, a small team, and I guess I represent a uni unique team because we don't have any PowerPoint slide to present to you. So I will just explain everything. So. We have a strong team uh, in our conviction that young people that are followed by Youth prote Protection Services Child Welfare who suffer from mental health problems need better services within the organization and better access to child psychiatry. This morning, uh, we have not heard about, this, uh, about the kids that are followed in uh, child welfare. And even though they are a very vulnerable uh, population, with respect to uh, mental health. Currently, young people experiencing abuse and neglect or behavioral problems and who additionally struggle with mental illness have great difficulty in accessing, accessing mental health services. And this is particularly true for young people who have borderline personality disorder, BPD. BPD is a very serious mental illness that had bad press with psychiatry and among child welfare workers who are very, very ill-equipped to intervene with these youth. We need to help the workers help these young people. BPD can be diagnosed in adolescence, can be detected early, can benefit from best practice. It has actually a really good prognosis when you use the right intervention with these young people. It is possible to reduce uh, the negative impact of this illness and to stop the intergenerational transmission of BPD and the intergenerational use of YPS, Youth Protection Services, services. 
actually about 47% of mothers with BPD in youth protection services themselves were followed by YPS when they were young. So we are a strong team because of our passion for the cause. But we also are a very strong team because of the history of our collaboration. Among the team, we co collaborate together in research regarding BPB, BPD and youth protection. We collaborate with each other uh, in development of program, in consultation, in complex cases, and in development of tools. I'm talking about uh, adult and child psychiatrists working with us. In the team, there's also a director of four personal disorder clinic in Montreal. There's, uh, uh, of course, uh, some decision and policy maker from uh, child welfare and a representative of youth and family member uh, at the Centre de Montréal and BACHA. So, what is unique in what we want to propose? The proposed transformation are grounded in clinical intervention and practice adapted from the Australian model. We have specific ideas on how to, uh, what we want to propose. We want, currently there is no screening, there's no, very little knowledge of mental illness among workers. There's no best practice, no clinical, very little clinical intervention done with those youth. Very little help from child psychiatry who only are there for very complex case and when the youth are in crisis. And nothing after 18 when the youth leave the YPA services. So we propose systematic screening. We propose that the intervener be uh, dedicated to work with youth that have uh, BPD. Uh, we propose also to have intervenants that will do a liaison with uh, psychiatry and community services. We also uh, believe that we should have some psych psychiatrists répondants, uh, which is a term in Quebec that will be, that will be working uh, closely with the youth protection services uh, to develop guidelines based on the Australian model and that adapted to the legal context of YPS. We propose also an advisory committee where the youth and the family will be there so that the parents are better helped, so they better understand what's happening and to help also the parents who have mental illness. Uh, there's also some specialized program in Montreal that are being uh, developed for youth with BPD uh, from 15 to 24, five years old, and this will be a major change. Our idea will make sure that the kids have better care because better care is also related to early care. Better care is related to best practices, to know-how by workers, to sustain intervention. Better care is related to workers that are feel empowered, that feel that they, it's safe to work with these young people and that are willing to work with these people. Better care, it's when a child psychiatrist work within uh, the YPA services and uh, help to have faster access to second and third line. We need to have a better care for young people who have BPD and which is also often associated with uh, many comorbid problems because actually when these young people have a diagnosis of BPD, they are more often excluded some, from services pe because people think there's nothing to do with them or afraid of them. Is that pretty much it? Are you okay? Pardon? Is, is that a, we've had five? Yeah, yeah. Two seconds. Biggest challenge is to, because of the size of the organization, is to uh, the challenge of implementing radical changes in the traditional structure of this organization. A very concrete ch difficulty is creating sustainable change in practice despite important turno turnover in frontline workers and then despite hiring practice when you hire people based on seniority and not on motivation, expertise or willingness to work with special population. And please you're welcome to come to the poster so I, we can talk to you about many other things. Fantastic. Thanks, Liz. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. We're going to take one more team and then, as we did with the networks, maybe take a five minutes so on your tables you can reflect on what you're hearing. Uh, so I'm going to ask the Manitoba Tram team, an innovative shared mental health care model in primary care, to improve access and quality of mental health services for youth. And that's... Roberta Woodgate, hi. 
Roberta. Huh? Thank you. I'm very pleased to be here and very pleased to represent the Manitoba team. Um, so um, this is a, pri a proposed study, that a project that we've been thinking about for a good year and a half. As you can see, the various people who came on board, um, from policymakers to researchers, service providers, families, and youth. And we all came on board with the concern about how can we improve mental health services in Manitoba, because like other provinces, we know um, it's very inadequate. Um, so we're very passionate about our work. At one point we were thinking of submitting to CIHR for our operating grant and also possibly the FISI CIHR special grant um, because we really want this to work in Manitoba. So what is unique about our, our, our proposed um, project? We're looking at what well, we see primary care as a hub of, should be the hub of health care in, in Manitoba. And primary care, um, working with mental health care um, providers as a shared care approach. Now, we know that's been done in adults um, and also possibly some youth. But what we're doing with ours, we're adding this a notch up by having this step approach where you have a series of uh, services from um, flourishing messages up to right to direct um, um, psychiatric support. Um, and we're going to be building capacity in the various primary care clinics in Manitoba and capacity for the families and youth, but also capacity for the people who work in the clinics. So we have support um, from our psych um, psychiatry. They're going to be there supporting the primary care providers and also mental health counsel counselors. Um, I think, too, what's unique as well is our step approach is not like I'm going to be climbing, climbing up one step at, at a time. It's going to be very flexible. Sometimes you may need to do two steps up and two steps back. And so, again, it's a very flexible, layered approach. Lastly, I think what's important is we're going to be um, doing this, uh, this project through a mixed methods approach, but framed within the re-aim um, framework. And this framework really helps to push what we know about knowledge into practice. Um, just some of the features of the re-aim um, uh, 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 design uh, uh, framework is, um, so it's, it's so reach, that refers to how many people participate in an intervention, effectiveness, to what extent are the program outcomes achieved, adoption, are the integrated settings involved in and adopting the, the initiative? Implementation. To what degree is intervention um, implemented as, as intended? And lastly, and what's most important is, how long can the effects of this intervention be maintained? We're really into building capacity in Manitoba. So I mean, that's, I think by using this REM framework, we'll be able to really look at, as we roll it out in certain primary care areas, um, we can scale up de de depending on what we're finding in each area. We're also looking at rolling this out in primary care clinics in Winnipeg, but also in northern areas and also in First Nations communities. Um, so, and next question, um, how will youth, those who are not normally identified in the, in, through mental health services, how will we be able to get to those youth? I think by building capacity in these clinics that we will be able to um, build and, and reach those youth who are not um, normally seen. And, last, and then how will this, our idea help more youth access care and how will they help get better care. And again, I think because we are directing the primary care clinics um, and also we are looking at best t type of care, um, the right person, and also what, who's best matched with the, with the care provider. Um, again, we really um, see this as um, with primary care being the hub of health care that um, we'll be able to make a difference. And the, I have to say too, some of the primary care clinics, clinics will be in schools and in teen clinics and also in, at, in, at our universities. Lastly, the last question we were, we were asked to answer, uh, what is the big, biggest challenge? And I think one of the biggest challenges is going to be rolling it out into the northern areas and also in, on the First Nations communities. I just recently completed a study looking at um, First Nations children with disabilities um, in our Norway House Cree Nation, which is a northern community. And it's really challenging when you have to, when you work in some of the communities, just distance alone. Um, Canada's a landmass, I think that's one of our challenges, so. Um, 
Finally, I'd like to say the features of our product, pro of our pro project includes it's very participatory. Um, it's based on a real partnership. Um, it's innovative. I think it's innovative because we are adopting a shared care approach as well as the step approach. It's practical because we are going to be flexible. It's not one shoe fits all. And I think it's going to be transformative because it promotes change at the individual but also systematic le at level. And lastly, it's sustainable. It's cost effective and it's proving access and quality of care. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Roberta. Thank you very much. Good. Uh, well, as I said, as we did before, uh, just a few minutes on your tables, just to reflect on what you've heard from those teams. We've had five. We've got another five to go, but just a few minutes. Yes. What have you heard? Who are you going to connect with? What sort of questions do you want to ask? So just a few minutes and then I'll pull us back together.